The keys to happiness. For eight years this book was on his mind, and for eight years he thought of it constantly. No, he was not going to make a groundbreaking discovery in literature of psychology. He just wanted to tell the story of something that had been tormenting him for many years, but he kept putting it off. For about 10 years he was in a relationship with a woman who filled his life with joy. Having no intention of leaving his family, he wanted to enjoy his little bit of quiet happiness. But it was not meant to be. June 1941 changed everything. You never know what you will find and you will lose along the way. Those were the happy days of his life. She was there to look after him. She was taking care of their home. She created a warm environment to make him feel loved, but also to enable him to concentrate on his writing. In Almata, he began writing his most important work. His most important book, his last love and everything that broke him, all of it was blessed by Alma Ata. Chapter 1. The Blessed City Was this during the same time period? Yes, this was Zoshinka's first month in Leningrad. It is also a well-known fact that he had gone to the recruitment office and submitted his application to be sent to the front as a volunteer. But he was deemed unfit for military service. The First World War, gas attack, a pride poisoning and as a result heart problems. The Civil War, malnutrition, digestive problems, he was ordered to evacuate. His wife and 20-year-old son remained in Leningrad. He was given a choice to be sent either to Tashkent or Mata. He chose the Hollywood on the Chinese border. I took with me 20 heavy notebooks. I had torn off the calico bindings, but still they weighed a ton, taking up eight of the 10 kilograms of my luggage admitted on the plane. And there were moments later on when I grieved and regretted having taken this junk instead of warm drawers or an extra pair of boots. In a torn out black briefcase, I brought my manuscripts into the blessed city of Almada. The blessed city greeted the writer with warmth and affection. I like it. This is a beautiful city, wrote Mikhail Mikhailovich to Lydia Chalova. Mikhail Zoshinka got a job at the screenwriting department of Mosfilm Studio. He wrote the script for director Grigory Alexandrov's Fallen Leaves. In 1942, he was writing a play for Yuri Zavatsky's theater, which was also in Almaty at the time. Unfortunately, neither the script nor the play was ever produced. However, the writer's concerts were a great success with the audience. This footage was shot at the hospital, which was located in Almaty School No. 28, where Zoshinka entertained his audience. He was reading his stories to the wounded soldiers. The listeners, standing in the hospital's crowded hallway, were laughing gratefully. Suddenly, the head of the hospital stood up, apologized to Zoshinka and addressed the patients. All those with jaw injuries, leave the room, he ordered. They have jawbone wounds, and it's not good for them to be laughing so hard, he explained to Mikhail Mikhailovich. For some time he lived in the hotel for filmmakers called the Soviet House. It was situated on the crossing of Kaban by Batyr and Ablahan streets. It was crowded and the residents were cold and hungry, but they got along well and the environment was friendly. The atmosphere in Almaty was very friendly. As usual, everyone living in a hotel visits one another. I too was in the room where Kapler, Zoshinka, Barnett and Rima Karmen lived. We had our fortunes told by Zoshinka. He had his own method. He asked the people whose fortunes he was about to read to tell him their secrets. He was so sad and serious. This is how I remembered him to this day. My father said he knew him. He said he always seemed to be terribly concentrated and looked rather somber and gloomy. Little is now left of that life as the past has been compressed in time and space. On the site of the hotel, there stands a very different, very modern landscape. Zoshinka's wife remained in the besieged Leningrad at the time, but Mikhail Mikhailovich did not give up hope to get her out of there and bring her here. Here is a telegram, for instance, urgent Leningrad, Gribayedov Canal. I have asked Moscow Union to help you or get you out. 
Hope they will do you as soon as possible. Kisses, Mikhail. But the family never came. Zoshinka did not stay at the hotel for very long because he couldn't work here, it was too crowded. He went to live in a rented apartment, and for a long time nobody knew where. Marietta Shaginyan came and, once all the famous people arrived, she said, but where is Zoshinka? And no one knew where he was. It turned out Zoshinka had nowhere to live. He resided somewhere on the outskirts of the city, in someone's backyard. He was immediately found, fed and given food stamps. Right away they found him a place to live. He was a very humble man. He never complained, never asked for anything. One three six Uzbek Street, apartment three. Now it is known as Sifulin Avenue. The house is long gone. He had fond memories of his host family and their hospitality. They were warm and pleasant people. Umutbay Balkashev, teacher of philosophy at one of the universities in Almaty, was invited to work in Moscow. And he decided to lease his room, his study. And Zoshinko was fortunate enough to be given this room here. An ottoman, bookshelves and of course a table. It was just a small room where the key to happiness lay. This was the name of the manuscript of his most important book. Chapter 2. A little piece of happiness. Of course he knew what he was worth. He had success in all shapes and forms, fame, money, admiration, female adoration and recognition at the state level, at the beginning at least. But nothing lasted. The money kept running out, recognition turned into a cold disregard and family life became rocky. Their love affair was both impossible and inevitable. One time when Mikhail Mikhailovich came in to get his salary, the girl in charge of the money did not recognize him and asked his name. At the beginning of the 1930s, it seemed to him that there wasn't a person out there who didn't know who he was. It seemed most unusual. And then the people there began to whisper, why, this is Zoshinka. That was when they first met. Mikhail Mikhailovich was walking down the corridor with his flowing coat unbuttoned. In his hands, which were turned out like rifles, he was carrying a tort and prickly pineapple, which looked like a turtle from afar. Everyone knew that it was a present for the senior technical editor, local femme fatale, Lidechka Chalava. Zoshinka knew that one ought not to change one's long-established way of life, and he never did. But here, the established order collapsed at once like a card house. The time had come when no one knew if they would live to see tomorrow. People here were trying to create, but not only that. They were trying to live their lives like there was no tomorrow. It was not a simple task to get another person evacuated. From the besieged Leningrad, Zoshinka summoned not his wife, but Lydia Chalova and her whole family, sister, mother and a newborn niece. All of his documents were signed here in Almaty, stating that Chalova was his secretary and that she required food cards and accommodation. He practically called her his wife. And of course, he rescued her family as well. Although the situation was ambiguous, his actual wife, Vera, remained in the besieged Leningrad. This timid and shy man, the man who was not in the habit of soliciting favors, often went hungry. He couldn't come and ask for food. But for love, he pulled out all the stops to be able to spend some time 
with the woman he loved. At the train station in Almaty, when I saw Zoshinka, I could hardly believe my eyes. I had seen many dystrophic people in Leningrad, I was almost dystrophic myself. But to see a person who was living far from military action look so horrible, no, it was an unbearable sight. He said that he was getting 400 grams of bread, eating half of it and exchanging the other half for half a litre of milk and an onion. That was his daily portion. At the studio where Lydia Chalava headed, nobody knew that Zoshinka was not receiving food stamps. The doctor diagnosed him with dystrophy and thanks to Lydia's efforts, he received additional food supply. He didn't die. The blessed city of Almaty although the situation was far from ideal. He was always writing to his wife in Leningrad, sending her money and worrying, and Chalava was aware of the situation. I think that was their little piece of happiness during the most difficult time of war. Lydia, behind this window there is Transilialatau and the key to happiness. According to Chalava, he was tormenting himself while writing the most important work of his life. Zoshinka finished the books, but the key to happiness got lost somewhere along the way, and the title required changing. You never know what you will lose and what you will gain in life. Chapter 3 Before Sunrise in spring 1943, he was summoned elsewhere and left the city, hoping to return soon. But it wasn't meant to happen. He never got to come back to Almaty or reclaim the state of happiness he possessed here, however fragile and ephemeral. I would very much like to walk down our quiet streets together, to sit with you on the rocks by the river. We will eat apples. I will bring with me more money. Lidushinka, be healthy and calm. All will be well. I hope you won't get too infatuated with anyone else. Don't forget about me, my girl. He had the book printed, the first chapters, an unusual book for the usually sarcastic Zoshinka. What is happiness? Where does the sadness come from? This longing for things that will never be, and whether one needs to try and free oneself from these feelings before sunrise. No one else had ever written so frankly and ruthlessly about one's own self. The final chapters were not published. What was published, however, was a multitude of expose reviews. And in 1946, the famous Zhdanov report came out. Entrenched in the rear during war, scoundrels, scum, the book is a disgusting thing, exposed his vile and dirty little soul. These all phrases from the report. Most of Zoshinka's friends turned away from the writer. With this book, he wanted to help people, to teach them to think and to organize their life, relying on their own experience. He knew that his book did not fit in with the time he was living in. But what was he to do? He used to say he had a weak heart and that it frightened him to die and leave the book unfinished. He was expelled from the writer's union and deprived of livelihood. He worked as a translator and a shoemaker. He sold books and other things. He left his family feeling misunderstood and unneeded. Lydia Chalava got married, but she continued to help him until the end of his life, as much as she could, of course. During the last years of his life, the writer was not really living, but slowly dying. How often was he visited by famous guests? Hardly anyone came into this room. He spent the last four years of his life here, practically all alone, feeling the need for privacy. This pillow was made by Mikhail Mikhailovich himself to enable him to write while lying down. He could no longer get up. His walking cane and worn-out shoes, size 38. This is how, before sunrise ends, these memories, the feeling of the blessed land, how peaceful and warm it was, how he got a chance to work there. The most precious things I have left in this world. First, sunshine. Second, art and mind. And thirdly, I think I might mention some fruit. Ripe pears, melons and watermelons.